Well, thank you for having me here. Uh, I was sitting in the car and just remembering uh, my PhD days and was wondering what am I doing out here. Uh, I did everything but science before I did a science career. In fact, in my PhD, I remember uh, I used to play cricket seriously. And uh, in the first phase when I was playing cricket, I used to think about experiments. And then I reached the point where when I had to do experiments, I was thinking about cricket. So then I stopped uh, the cricket and uh, got on with science. Uh, what we do really, uh, as I said, mine was a journey of an accident in the science. And what we have done mostly is uh, enable a collaborative ecosystem. And I'll tell you three ecosystems that we've worked with. Uh, the ecosystem of at CBS, where we looked at developmental pathways in cancer. Uh, the ecosystem at St. John's, which led to St. John's Medical College, which led to a viral sequencing uh, and then DNA and mRNA vaccine technologies. And a third ecosystem that I've engaged with recently, uh, which is an Ayurvedic ecosystem under the larger Ayush bandwidth. And I'll uh, hopefully tell you a little bit about knowledge frameworks and the philosophy of why are we doing that uh, as we're going along? So as I, just to repeat, these are the, these are the three or four things that we've done. Uh, we've also worked extensively with Africa and I'll, it's a bi-directional process. And uh, when I get to that slide, I'll tell you more about it. Uh, so cervical, ca cervical cancers are caused by human oncogenic papillomaviruses. Um, and the discovery of this discovery led to Adder Zerhaus and getting a Nobel Prize. Uh, several years ago. Uh, we've been interested in one question, uh, and there's a model of cancer progression where cancers go from the initial immortalization to a full cancer. Uh, and it was thought that you need two events, the dysregulation of cell cycle, the upregulation of telomerase for the initial immortalization, and then the activation of the RAS pathway to make a tumor. And this was a very famous model that Bob Weinberg's lab uh, created about 25 years ago. Uh, and this is the model that Bob Weinberg's lab created 25 years ago as a general model of cancers. And they used uh, SV40 large T and papillomaviruses are very similar to SV40 large T, uh, but there's one fundamental difference. There are no activated or virtually no activated RAS mutations in cervical cancers. So we've been asking the same question for nearly 20, 25 years, which is, what substitute for activated RAS? Is there something that can phenocopy, to use a technical term, or complement papillomavirus oncogene function uh, as part of the process of tumorigenic progression? And this is where the ecosystem, so just to tell you the people who built this, and we had a very interesting ecosystem. This was in 94, uh, but the lab started in 92. Uh, Vinay, Niru, Betty, and Anu, and they were all four doing different things. Uh, Vinay was working with papillomavirus transcription and the whole of papillomavirus oncogenes. Nirupama was working with a fly developer model. Betty was working in, in, with Kibba Memorial Hospital looking at cancer progression in the clinic. And Anu was looking at complementation assays of oncogene function. And so, to, in a sense, this microenvironment of the first four people, and there were others, Michi, Sukanya, and I also joined, essentially established what became a framework for our lab in terms of a collaborative ecosystem and, and working across model systems. We tend to think, and most of you read about this in the newspapers, you read about this gene, that gene, and you know, this is causing this and it's causing that. Uh, actually, there's a bias there because genes are part of pathways. And if you look at the notch pathway, uh, which we work with, then you find which is at the top of this pathway, which is somebody else's figure, but it's pretty similar to what we've done you find that actually genes operate in pathways and networks. And that's a lesson that I would like to get across to you and to a wider audience, that really a lot of pathology, a lot of biology is driven by networks of multiple interactions. And how these interactions operate often give you either a biological context like a developmental biology or the formation of the brain, or it gives you a disease. Uh, and this is also poses a challenge because when you're thinking of it from a therapeutic perspective, if the same pathways or the same networks 
are working in normal cells and are working in diseases of various kinds, how do you deal with it? There is no simple answer. And that's why the therapeutic strategies towards Notch and other pathways is a fairly complex challenge. So the, this happened essentially because uh, we were interested not in the Notch pathway itself, but a similar kind of pathway, which is the scallop pathway, which causes fly baby weight. And this is what I was talking about, the context, that in the neighborhood, there were developmental biologists who were working with this kind of pathway. We collaborated with them, and that got us thinking about working with a pathway for 20, 25 years. Um, one of the approaches that we've taken is we've always intensely collaborated with Anapurni Rangarajan's paper with Paolo Dotto in Boston, where she looked at the role of a notch pathway in differentiation. So you look at the novel cells, and then she also looked at in the progression of cervical cancers. And this, these are how the tumors are formed when you generate with papillomavirus oncogenes and activated notch signaling. These are cancer stem cells, which we identify. So cancer stem cells is something that became very important about 10, 15 years ago. And so we went ahead then and identified cancer stem cells in the context of cervical cancer and showed that they're also dependent on not signaling. Uh, this, is, this is the other paper in Anu published 25 years ago, which actually sets the stage in addition to the keratinocyte differentiation. But I just want to take one minute to tell you something very interesting that we found. Uh, there's a variant of papillomaviruses which often accumulate in cervical cancers, and this variant shuts off the rash pathway. So if you actually take this variant and you collaborate with RAS, it doesn't work. So this goes back to what I was saying, that selection events, which are either complementary or antagonistic, are the basis of a lot of biology and a lot of pathology. Uh, the paper, if you have the time to read, uh, in about, about five years ago, uh, summarizes the genetics from other people's work of the genomics and shows that there's consistent activation of the Nosh pathway by both expression and various genetic mechanisms, uh, which ha happens with Nosh pathway. Uh, this work from Shashi, where she's documented this. And I sort of already mentioned this, uh, that there is a therapeutic challenge when you're dealing with normal uh, pathways. And maybe if there's a few minutes at the end, I can come back to this. I just want to talk about two other stories, then maybe if there's time at the end, come back to this. So the second project that I want to talk about is in 2008, we set up a program with St. John's Medical College, which is a fairly small grant. And here is the importance of this event. A coffee table conversation between Chitra, who was a graduate student in our lab, uh, Chitra Patabi Raman, and Mary Dias, who's a clinical microbiologist. And Mary turned to Chitra and said, look, I have this sample of fever of unknown origin. Can you tell me what it is? And this is, again, a very important part of collaborations that somebody who asks the question often does not know the technology. And so it's so important to work across the silos. So Chitra said, I'll sequence it for you. And Chitra, then, because she knew the technology, Chitra sequenced the sample for her. It turned out to be a dengue virus genome. And that was the start of our dengue project in parallel to the Papadroma virus project. So the dengue project, uh, we then, Narai Muti visited us around that time a little later and said I'd fund the dengue vaccine program. And so we got started uh, in working with data, uh, vaccines against dengue using platforms and technologies which are contemporary. So what we so the, the big challenge, and actually there is a dengue season right now underway in India and elsewhere. And one of the big challenges with dengue is the cross-reactivity across serotypes and what is called antibody-dependent enhancement, which you can read out. And so Arun Shankar Das, who was a postdoc in the lab, uh, made a very nice piece of work with the DNA dengue vaccine based on the expanded sequencing, collaborated with our colleagues in Africa, and also uh, published this paper uh, using a, a region of the virus which does not generate cross-reactivity, but works across all the four serotypes. Uh, I actually spent five years as a child in North Africa, and I've been very closely associated uh, with Africa right from all my life. And I just want to quickly tell you the story of Onesimus. Uh, we tend to think of knowledge systems and the flow of knowledge in one way. Uh, but Onesimus was actually a slave. He was an African slave who went to America. And his master said, but you're not getting smallpox. And do you know the answer to that? He said, I've been variolated. 
Variolation is something which began in India, went to the Ottomans, and went to Africa. And Onesimus was a slave who took it to America. And Martha, whose father actually set up Harvard College, and then the president, Washington, used it uh, in a process and inoculated all the troops by a process called postulation, uh, which you use uh, against smallpox. So knowledge systems flow across centuries, they flow across continents, and that's something that I really would like you to bear in mind. It's not a one-dimensional thing. And with that in mind, uh, there's something that I've been very interested in, is knowledge systems. Uh, this is the mRNA vaccine work. But I, so my grandfather was an Ayurvedic physician, uh, and he's, he founded a company about 110 years ago in a small village near Mysore. Uh, it's called Sadhraya Deshala in Manjungur. The But the story that I want to tell you about is about Macaulay. Uh, Macaulay in 1835, there was this debate between what are called the Orientalists versus the Anglicists. Um, because in the period 1820 to 1835, in Calcutta, when they had first set up the medical college, there was Ayurveda, there was Yunali, there was uh, modern medicine or allopathy. And then the Anglicists won the debate and they shut down Ayurveda and Yunani. And I think a very interesting opportunity was lost because this context where you work across systems, uh, if you think of personalized medicine, today modern medicine is talking about personalized medicine through genomics and proteomics and this kind of thing. But personalized medicine has been part of the thinking process of the Irish stream for thousands of years. So there's a lot of space for crosstalk. And uh, off late, uh, this, this is the Ayurvedic college that my grandfather went to uh, in 1910 or so. And this is the medical college, which is also built by the Mysore royalty, which is a very progressive organization about 100 years ago. But I don't think they work with each other. And I believe in Bairabur, there's a homeopathic college and this medical college not very far from each other. And I would encourage you all to work across the stream, whether it's artificial intelligence, and I'll tell you what we're doing within artificial intelligence, whether it's engineering, whether it's the Ayush gene, ecosystems and neighbors who work across the system uh, land up doing different things and contributing. And in addition to your own specialized domain, uh, this can be quite a useful way of thinking about it. So I'm currently working with an ecosystem which is called the TDU IAIM ecosystem in Bangalore, there in the Alanka Bangalore. They have a conservation, very extensive, I think 110 field sites of conservation. They have an Ayurvedic hospital and they have an Ayurvedic biology program. And this is roughly uh, the perspective which they're asking how do you integrate knowledge frameworks? So the common challenges is, of course, is toxicity. The common challenges are efficacy. The common challenges are effectiveness. Uh, but there are ways of thinking about it. And do you think about it the way you do allopathy, which is randomized clinical trials, clinical case reports, or do you build knowledge evidence from the entire case studies that you have? So one way that they're thinking about it is what they call real-world evidence where you take all the patient data that you have in your hospital and see how that emerges. And then this unbiased analysis uh, gives you a way of thinking about it, in addition to case reports and so on. There is the other school of thought, and I just mentioned it to you without any bias from my end, which says that there are actually different knowledge frameworks. And the way you think about these knowledge systems, the way you think about disease is actually different. And I think it's important to be in a place where one is listening across the board and then takes this further but it's certainly a place where I would encourage you all to also think about. Oh. So colleagues in the TDU AIM system are using, and so this is an interesting piece of data where they've looked at diabetes outcomes, uh, both in terms of blood sugar and various other parameters with traditional formulations, and they're getting very interesting results uh, in the clinical case study series that they've been working. They're also working, uh, they've also been working with AI tools uh, across these systems, uh, and, and that's gone quite well, and they're doing, getting some very interesting results. So it reiterates uh, a point that I was making, which is that you can bring in model technologies, you can bring in new ways of thinking about data uh, across these systems, and I think, and I hope this will uh, be the way of the future. Uh, I just, a word about network pharmacology. Uh, it's something that I'm deeply interested in, uh, and I talked to you about how I'm interested in networks, the notch pathway and various networks. The problem when you're dealing with networks is you're actually not dealing with classical pharmacology where you're working against a single lighting. So much of the drugs that we take, much of the tablets that we take are single targeted pharmacology. In network pharmacology, 
uh, you're actually working at the entire network. In traditional medicines, have variability. Uh, they're not organically, they're not synthesized in a certain chemical kind of way. They're complexes of formulations. And I don't actually know how they were discovered. And, and this is something that I really would be very interested in, in learning more about how they were originally discovered. But what is interesting about them is they promptly work against networks. Uh, and this is something, again, for you to think about whether there is a pool of knowledge out there which we can use in terms of the system. So this is a course that I'm not associated with. This is the, uh, the organization that I'm affiliated with right now. I have this course and uh, they're thinking about it and I think they should evolve and move on uh, in how they're thinking about this course. So I'll leave it there and I hope I've given you a sense of uh, the three or four projects that we've been doing, uh, which is a core area of cervical cancer looking at development pathways, uh, the dengue vaccine program, which began with a single fever of unknown origin, uh, fever of unknown origin with Chetra sequence, and then led to the program, and now our interactions with the IU stream, and we hope that we can extend it all the way across the entire IU stream and bring knowledge networks together. Thank you.